Let's get going. Have you ever noticed that some presenters struggle on the physical or virtual stage while others truly shine? Do you ever wish you knew their secrets? Here's some good news. Help has arrived. In 1995, Mark Brown outspoke more than 20,000 international contestants to win the World Championship of Public Speaking. Since then, he has dedicated himself to achieving excellence on the platform and to helping others do the same. As a professional speaker and executive speaking coach, he has mastered the simple yet powerful techniques that have served him and his fellow professional speakers for decades. The same techniques that he teaches to emerging speakers corporate CEOs and experienced professionals. During this highly interactive program, he will put, pull back the curtain and reveal proven strategies that will help you command both the physical and virtual stage, transforming every presentation into an audience experience. Please help me welcome the 1995 World Champion of Public Speaking and Certified Speaking Professional, our friend, Mark Brown. <laughs> I'm pulling back the curtain. No, no, no. <laughs> that was that so was bad. So bad. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters friends who are in the room and in the Zoom room. It's cool to be with you. Allow me to be very practical today. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I won't mess anything up because it's fun doing this as a hybrid, in a hybrid environment. So here we go. I'm going to share the screen. First of all, I'm going to show you the power of what I call really good Photoshop. All right, here you go. So. <laughs> Here's the, Here's the deal. Stop, Stop giving, giving speeches. speeches. Say what? Stop, Stop giving, giving speeches. speeches. I'm going to use extra slides today for those who are in the Zoom so they will see what I, they'll see what I say. I'm going to say, Stop giving speeches. Start paying attention to John while he helps me out over here. We're good, John? All right. Stop, Stop giving, giving speeches. speeches. Instead, I'm going to ask you, not command, I'm going to ask you to start delivering experiences. Stop giving speeches, start delivering experiences. Many of us come to Toastmasters, we want to learn to speak gooder, okay? So we come to join Toastmasters to speak good, I mean better. No grammarians in the house? Uh, it's Sunday morning, it's probably too early. <laughs> We want to learn to master the platform skills and deliver wonderful presentations. And having been involved for almost 30 years, I feel free to say this. Lighten up. We don't need to be so perfect every single time. I'll share a brief experience that happened to me in Sri Lanka, Colombo, Sri Lanka, many years ago. I was a guest presenter at an event. The event was to feature the world champion speaker, Mark Brown. Huge auditorium at a university, over 500 attendees, and it went wonderfully well. I was so happy to have served them, and one individual approached me after my presentation. You know, Mark, that's very, very good material, but I gotta tell you, I'm a little, little disappointed in you. I said, really, why? You put your hand in your pocket when you spoke. Wow. <laughs> I traveled halfway around the world to deliver a message and they noticed my hand was in my pocket. And we tend to get so precise and so particular about how we present. But I say start delivering an experience for the audience because when they have an experience, in my experience, they remember the message. Your stories, the way you related to them, they remember what it was like to be with you in the room virtual or physical, and those who are online virtually, if you're willing to do this, I recommend you do side-by-side -side mode so you can see my slides on one side and hopefully you'll see me on the other. And feel free to move that little bar back and forth to make a slide as big as you want or as small as you want as you see fit. 
I say stop giving speeches, start delivering experiences. How do we do that in a practical sense? And many of us hear platform mastery, they think, okay, I'm going to master the skills of being on the platform, how I handle this space, my speaking area, small or large, though it may be. But the truth is, platform mastery really is more than the mechanics of it. Platform mastery is not just about the mechanics of what I do when I'm on the stage. I have an idea for you, maybe even a challenge for you. How cool would it be to have your audience fall in love with you before you say a word? Who would like that? Give me a yes, a yes or a yes or a yes. Online, do me a favor. You want to give me like a, um, a thumbs up, an emoji, an emoticon or a reaction button. Give me a thumbs up or a wave online. Let's see what we got here. A couple of those. Let's see. Anybody here there? Are still awake? Okay, a couple of you are still there. All right, good. Cool. It would be great to have the audience love you and at least interested before you speak. Now, let me ask a question. You probably heard about the program through the district and then you heard about what's coming up, how to master the platform skills. I learned it was important for me to peak interest even before I say a word. How do we peak the audience's interest before we even say one word of our presentation? Any ideas in the room? How can we peak our audience's interest before we say a word? Anybody? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller. Uh, in the back, yes. Before you can speak with them, before you go up here? Ah, ha, 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 ha. You said speak with the audience members before you take the platform. I have a phrase for that. It's not mine. I got it from Darren LaCroix and Craig Ballantyne, two other world champions. There may be individuals here who, are, who know what this is. It's called establishing before rapport. You establish before rapport. Have rapport with the audience before you even go there. Darren LaCroix, my buddy, we speak professionally. We get hired to go to a corporate event. We make it a practice to go in at least, at least one day early. We attend a session or two. We attend the evening cocktail hour. That can be really interesting. <laughs> you put some alcohol in people, man, stuff comes up. But you established before a report. I was in the bathroom room earlier. I didn't even get your name. We began to speak before the meeting. And now, I guess she's curious. What has he got to share with me? And she told me, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. I said, me too. <laughs> but you get your audience interested before you even take the platform at a corporate event, a meeting. Mingle, talk to people, have conversations, find out what's important to them, because you will be surprised to know how much material, if you're willing to do this, you can insert into a presentation based on a conversation you had the night before at cocktail hour, or even the morning at breakfast. By show of hands, who's tried that before? It can be, thank you so much, all these hands, it can be a very powerful tool for the audience getting to know and like you before you even say a word. That's one surefire way I use and have, has, have used continually. There is another I want to rec I'd like to recommend as well to establish, have the audience more interested in you. And I call it a simple tool of a prepared introduction. A prepared introduction. Now the key word there is prepared. Why do I say that? If anyone here has done a corporate or a professional uh, gig, we call it gigs in the business, or been asked to speak at the local chamber of commerce, the JCs, the, the Kiwanis or the Lions Club, the local service club, the boys and girls clubs, etc., very often I say, okay, we'll introduce you. Do you know how most people get an intro for you? They Google you. If you have a website, they'll go to your website and they'll recite your bio as your introduction. That is not the purpose of the introduction. So here's my first recommendation regarding introductions. Write your own. Write your own introduction and give that to your introducer. Lefford Fate did not invent what he said earlier. I prepared that and sent it to him. Now, if you recall the content of the introduction, he asked a question. Have you ever noticed that some people shine on stage and online while others struggle? I stood in the back and I watched heads going up and down. You nodded. 
when he asked the question. Because the introduction spoke to the purpose of the meeting. You don't, don't leave that to chance. Already you're curious. Yes, I know people who are nervous. He says, well, look, do you want to know your secrets? Yeah, I want to know your secrets. And guess what? Many of you were leaning in before I even come, came on stage because you wanted to know what will he share with me to help me be better on stage. Is that true or is that true? Show of hands. Exactly. Lead the audience to love you before you say a word by preparing your own introductions specifically geared towards having the audience know what's coming, why you are there, and why you are the perfect person to share with them the message you've worked so hard to prepare. So I recommend highly use your own introduction. Now, I will confess, even at the professional level, there are individuals who will take that introduction and they'll riff and they'll ad lib and they'll go off in left field somewhere to take it to Kansas, Missouri, and then back to South Carolina before they get to the point. Sometimes you can't help that, but I've learned to do two things. One, I will send my intro to the introducer as a PDF, not a Word document. Why? They can't, thank you, Douglas, they can't change it. And I also bring a copy with me. Now, I trust Lefford Fate. I do. He's all good. And I brought, yes, can I help? Can I serve? Oh, okay, did I miss something up? I missed something up? By the way, always trust your tech team. Okay. And all kidding aside, as a sidebar, I mean it sincerely. Whenever I do I have an engagement, professional or otherwise, I want to be the tech team's best friend. I want to be their favorite. I want to do as little as possible to annoy and upset them. I want them to love me because they can accidentally mute me at Remember their names. Whatever tool you need to do to do that, remember their names and thank them profusely because they make you sound good. Thank you very much. John! And Bernie! So one, write your intro. Two, PDF, send it. And three, my backpack's back here. I'm not just saying this. Have your copy, have with, your copy you. with you. Now, why is that important? Because sometimes introducers aren't as cool as Lefford and put it on their, on their iPad. They'll have papers with them on the platform. And sometimes it's ready to go. But somebody, maybe the district director, but not in this case, will come up with their notes because they'll say that someone gave them a script to say exactly what to say during the contest, but I'm not going to say anything about that. And uh, <laughs> please understand, Douglas and I go back to what, 04? Almost 20 years, so we, I, I can tease Douglas. It happens. They do their thing and they're done and they, and they leave the platform and where's the intro? Oh, it's in their stack of papers and they don't know what to say. It's always wise, bring an extra copy. This is extra material just for you to know that works for me, that I've learned the hard way. Trust me, I've learned it the hard way. I even had my notes for a keynote, my very first keynote, Toastmasters 46, back in 94. I left my notes there and the, the, the DG came and took and left took my notes with him. And I'm the keynote speaker, I'm a ha, 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 ha. But I was able to ask for them to get them back. PDF. Bring your own copy and make and ask them nicely. I said, and I volunteer. Don't worry about the intro. I'll prepare one for you. You have so many more things to think about. You are stressed right now. I'll hand that to you. You'll be fine, okay? I do ask one thing though. Please read it as written because the intro is designed to prepare the audience for what I have to say. Take control of that. Make your audience curious and love you before you say a word. So please, please, please. Prepare the introduction. You finally introduced, you're on stage. Platform mastery, we're getting there. Perhaps you see in a contest, you're told name, title, title, name, and you do your thing. 
Sometimes we come on stage and as Toastmasters, very often we're eager to share what we've worked on. We're introduced, we come on and we start. Back up a little bit. Perhaps it's wise to first just own the space you're in before you say anything. I'll say here again for benefit of those online, own your space. What do I mean by own your space? By the time you're on the platform, this is your house. Not in an arrogant way. Let me explain. Now, perhaps many of us have not had this experience, but I've gone to events where I am not the only speaker on the agenda. I may be second or third. And sometimes number one and number two, they rock the house and the audience loves what they have to say. And then it's up to you to follow them. I've been there. It's wise to take a beat or two and gain some comfort on the platform. But there's one more secret that I mean, no contestants who have done the live contest have mastered this. I believe Douglas knows this. If you can, go into the room before the meeting when no one's there. Walk on the platform, feel the space, feel the room, know the space, be aware of where there are creaks in the floor. And if you can, try to circumvent or avoid them surreptitiously without anyone being obvious about it. And also, ladies, <laughs> I had a client, a large company, had a meeting in Florida, and the president, the CEO, was going to deliver on a large stage, and I went in two days early to work with her to make sure she was ready, and I noticed a few of the ladies were wearing what we call in Jamaica, pike heel shoes. Stilettos, and sometimes, ouch. <laughs> platform mastery isn't always about giving the speech, it's understanding the physical platform as well. But when you own your space for a moment and then do what I call the Ed Tate scan. Ed Tate is the 2000 world champion. He always scans the audience first. This morning I didn't do that because I know y'all. We're fun, we're family now, right? We're cool. So I can just come over here and do a crazy curtain pull. It's cool. But own your space, feel the room, and give yourself a few heartbeats of pause to be ready. Whatever you do to prepare yourself, use that. Meditate, pray, whatever. But when you come on stage, it is your stage. It's your time. It's very important, especially when you follow somebody who's been good and their minds are on the audience. Also, please note this, particularly at an event or a conference, what happens is speaker number one speaks, Audience is enwrapped, and when they're done, they take their time and, oh, I'll check my phone right now. Who has done that before when somebody was introduced? Yeah, <laughs> for this is one of these. I'm soaking my head, right? Give the audience chance to see you. Eyes on you, own your space. The second part of that is, in some people's minds, debatable. An extra couple more seconds of pause to really make sure everyone's with you. I will confess, I spent 17 years in middle schools and high schools across North America, large gymnasiums, 800 kids sometimes. And I would wait for a full minute because kids can be antsy. I'll wait, I'll look around, and I'll just pause and wait for them to put their eyes on me. Not for any reasons of ego, but I've worked hard to deliver a message. I don't want them to miss any of it. Now for the controversial statement. One of the greatest practitioners of this using the pause before they speak is not only famous, but infamous, but precious few people were as good at this as Adolf Hitler. He would stand, this video, he'd stand for a minute and the audience was, they couldn't wait to hear what he had to say. And he just, because he knew how to command that space before he spoke. No credit for what he did as a dictator, but as an orator and a presenter, he mastered that particular skill. And if we do that well, we will command, we will own our platform. It is a small thing, but all the before rapport, all the prep gets you on the platform. Now it's your time to shine. Now by show of hands or with a reaction button on, on, online, have you ever been told the purpose of the opening is? Anybody heard that before? Okay, so let's ask a question. The purpose of your opening is, 
any takers. Now, question, by the way, uh, Bernie and John, do we need to have anyone in the room use that mic to answer the questions? Or I, I, I can simply repeat their answers if you want. Whatever works. Okay, anybody, real quickly, the purpose of the opening is, yes, Michael, to make a connection. Very interesting answer, because you know what? That is, okay, Pete the crowd's interest, excellent, thank you. Yes, Glenn. Hook your audience. Hook your audience, wonderful. Funny thing is, no one here has given the answer I've heard most in the last 28 years. The purpose of the opening is to get their attention. Who has heard that before? Okay. Oh, I, now you raise your hands. <laughs> what is it? Okay, fine. Yes, I've often been told to get their attention. But I thank you, Michael, for your response. Because in the simplest of terms, it is to get their attention and to make a connection. But here's a funny part and a cool part about making a connection. To what? To make a connection to what? And the blank screen is mine. Don't get freaked out. It's all right. To make a connection to what? Or to whom? Of course, your audience. Yes. But also, as Douglas says, to your message, it really is a twofold connection. If our opening is really well crafted, we'll connect to the audience. Yes. We'll also connect to our message. I said, stop giving speeches, start giving experiences. That is a direct connection to the purpose of this talk. To master the platform, online and, online and on stage, we want to have, give our audience a memorable experience. I even had Leffert in my introduction talk about unforgettable experience. If you want to connect to the audience quickly, especially if you're a contestant giving a seven minute speech, you haven't got a lot of time there's not a lot of time to sort of build up and you, you got to get to the point quickly. You got to kind of, you know, do the Hollywood cold open, boom, the fight's going on, the cars, chase is going on. You want to get there quickly if you can to give yourself enough time to deliver the message effectively. But you want to open to make a connection to the audience, to connect to you, and also to connect to your message. And the connection to the audience is really cool. Here's why. If we can connect to the audience emotionally, there's a buy-in there. If we can connect to the audience emotionally, there is a buy-in for them to want to be a part of your message. Word of caution to my fellow Toastmasters. I know sometimes we're told, pick a topic of your own choosing, which might be really meaningful to you. But it's wise to always ask, yeah, I love this, but will my audience relate to it? That's a hard truth to face sometimes. I may be totally in love with nuclear physics, and I'm not. I don't know a thing about it. And I could give 8, 10, 15 talks on nuclear physics, but if my audience can't connect and relate to that, I've made an error, despite all my hard work. My mindset is, how can I best serve my audience? How can I connect with the audience? And you master your platform before you master your platform. It's not all about physical platform service, platform mastery. It's about the experience the audience has. Can you relate to that? Can I get an amen or a yes or a all right, Yaman, okay, no problem. Particularly online, virtual, the concern I often hear is, I have a hard time with audience engagement. I'm online, it's so flat, I can't do that. I'll talk about both physical and virtual today, and I'll invest some time on the back end, just on virtual. But there are different ways for us to engage the audience, and I like, I'm getting some nice responses here, okay? One is, you ask questions. We've been here, what, 15 minutes? And I've asked at least one question. How many have I asked so far? Maybe four or five? Quick engagement. And you have to be alert. You have to look. Look for the head nods. If people nod their heads, as Leffert said, they nod their head, they poke their neighbor, they write something down, you're engaging them and they're getting a point. But you want to be aware of every opportunity to engage your audience. You want to establish a relationship with your audience if you can. So ask questions. And I call this pinging the audience sometimes. You toss us, can you relate to that? Can you get this? People say, make sense? Is this helpful? All right? Or we ask simple questions that will get, require a nod or a wave of a hand. And if you're virtual, I often say, 
if you agree in the chat, give me a Y for yes and for no in the chat. Or hit the reaction button for me, will you please, so I can see. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a wave. Give me the balloons. Whatever you want to use, give me a reaction. Cool. I love that. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I'm engaging them online. I'm also engaging in person by asking some simple questions that don't even require a verbal response, just a physical response. When your audience nods, when they poke their neighbor, or when they give you the confused dog look, huh? at least you are engaging them, and it means you're also making your audience think. You want to give them an experience that begins with simple interactions and engagement. It's simple. And if we are vulnerable and tell our stories about our own weaknesses, and they ask, who's done that before? Show of hands, right? You ever done that? You ever felt this way before? Have you ever made a bad choice like I did? Right? That's all simple ways to engage, and they know you're not only in control of your stage, but you're in control of the conversation. I didn't say the speech. I said the conversation. It's conversational. It may not be verbally back and forth, but it's conversational. We're connecting. These are simple tools. And very often with Toastmasters, we're so caught up in getting the right words in our speech and saying the right things and delivering our message, we don't often realize without the connection, they're hearing words, not having the experience. They're only hearing the words. They aren't having the experience. It took me a while to learn this. I wanted to be very good on the platform. But if you can walk out of here after a weekend and, you know, with two or three different nuggets that I, I left with you, I'll feel better. If you walk out here knowing my wife a little better, I'll feel cool about that. If you walk out here knowing me a little better, because I've been able to establish a relationship and engage you both on the platform and in the halls, I'll feel a little bit better. But it's okay to ping the audience and ask a question here and there. Is that cool with you? Am I getting through? Does, does it make sense? Have you been there? Do you understand this? Do you see why I made a mistake? <laughs> you did that before, right. And again, you just get head nods. You're engaging your audience. Simple techniques, but they work oh so wonderfully. But we can step it up a little bit more. We can get the audience to participate. Now, not everyone likes audience participation. Mark, I don't do workshops. I do keynotes. We don't do audience participation. We all do. We think they must get up, jump, run around the room and do... It doesn't mean activities, it just means getting the audience involved in some small way. And I learned something some time ago that kind of got my attention. I, I, I realized that we often ask yes, no questions. But sometimes some questions can be open-ended. I asked a question yesterday. I said, in your experience, how many people attend a high school football soccer game here in South Carolina? And someone gave me a number. Someone said, well, parents always come to the game. That's someone responding to a question, not just a yes, no question. And you have to be selective in order to be effective. You choose when to use the open-ended questions, and you choose the yes or no. But you must decide what's going to work best for you and your presentation. But it doesn't mean because I'm a speaker, I'm not a workshop presenter, therefore I will never have any audience member participate. No. And sometimes you can get the audience moving with a please stand if. I was doing a program for a school, a school system, and we had educators there across the entire school district. And they had them all stand. I said, okay, please, if you're a teacher, please stand. That's a dull question. We're all teachers, Mark. Yeah, what are you doing? Please stand, okay. If you've been a, in a teacher for fewer than five years, please sit. And I went five, 10, 15, 20. I got to 42 years, and there were two teachers still standing. Visually, that was powerful. I was able to, to applaud them, to commend them, and it was really cool seeing the audience turn around and applaud these teachers who had been there for 42 years. It was the audience participating in honoring their associates, their veterans. Now, I'm the keynote speaker, but I use one small technique by getting people to stand to offer recognition, but that was strategic. We don't do these things for nothing because it's nice to change it up. Yeah, it's nice to change it up, but it must be strategic. Simpler, without standing, I could ask for a show of hands. I did ask for a show of hands. By show of hands, who's done that before? Hands are in the air. 
you ask for a show of hands. And there's one question too many people ask that I always take, take exception to. How many of you have ever been to a football game, right? How many of you have ever had dinner at Bonefish Grill? How many of you have ever heard Douglas Wilson speak, right? Do you realize the question, how many of you ask for a numerical response? It wants a number. Better is by show of hands. Have you ever heard Douglas Wilson speak? Okay. Please raise your hand if you have ever made the mistake I did and said no to my wife. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> but raise your hand if, by show of hands, have you, do you, have you ever, did you? But that ask the audience clearly to indicate by show of hands. Or please stand if you've been teaching for more than 10 years. But how many of you ask the word how many, the phrase is asking for a number. The answer can't be a number. How many of you are human? I mean, you're, you want seven? No, don't. You could just ask for a wave, ask to stand, but ask the audience to participate in some particular way. Not only are you in control of your platform, but you're in control of the experience the audience has. Mastering is not just what you do here. It's what the audience experiences here and even here. We'll go into some detail about that later on. With a virtual audience, I'll say, please, in the chat, give me a why, a yes, a give me a no. I'm getting whys and ends right now on the chat, by the way. I'm getting responses in the chat. Thank you so very much online. Zoom room, cool, yeah, man. I ask for chat. I ask for reactions. I ask for open your camera, please, and give me a wave if. I get that. I do get people to respond. I was doing a program for a group in Toastmasters. It must have been... 800 people you try scrolling through your screen with 800 people on a zoom from nepal but the chat was a because they respond and the simplest way is often to ask give me a why for yes and for no if and the audience you'll see the why's and the end will scroll through you can indicate or i often say in one word can you explain to me the emotion you felt when don told that story in one word in the chat You'll see angry, frustrated, terrified, all of these words popping up. That's the audience engaging and participating in the virtual. Use these tools to hear what they have to say. True, you can use polls also in virtual, but it's not that hard to ask for a why for yes and for no. Please don't ask for an 18 word answer from 800 people. Not a good look. I would not recommend it. But you want the audience to feel they're a part of what's happening. And I love the idea that we can do this in a virtual world. There's also one more thing that I learned that I didn't know I was doing, but I was doing. It's called using the mirror neurons. Who's heard of that before? Mirror neurons? Of course, Douglas is duh. I am no psychologist, psychotherapist, psychoanalyst. I'm no psycho anything, and I'm no psycho. <laughs> but I've learned that the mirror neuron is in its simplest form we respond mirroring the acts of someone else. I vividly recall being in Jamaica years ago in the 1970s, I guess 79, okay? Went to a play with my girlfriend. Her name was Andrea. Actually, it still is Andrea, there she is. She's not even hearing me. We went to a play at the Little Theater in Jamaica, a comedy, and it was very funny. One actor was, he had the whole place in stitches. We got the cheap seats up on the balcony in the back, and he dropped a line, the place roared, and he followed up with an even funnier line. And Andrea beside me, she is almost in tears laughing. <laughs> and I said, hey, honey, did you hear what he just said? She said, no. <laughs> I said, so why are you laughing? Everybody else is. <laughs> we laugh about that. How many times do we laugh because somebody else laughed? We, get, we hear about mob mentality. We get angry because somebody else gets angry. And often all it takes is for one person to lead the action and the mirror neurons kick in. Believe it or not, I used it earlier today. Here's an example. Would you agree that it's good to learn how to give a good speech in Toastmasters? Would you agree? Should I show of hands? Right. So I lead by showing hands. People follow. I nod and I smile, people nod and smile. It's a simple technique. 
we often raise our hands first and someone somewhere will mirror our action and raise their hands. And people will do what they do because others are doing it. I'm trying to recall, oh, there's a TV show called The Push. Was it on Netflix? Anybody saw The Push? Nobody? Check it out. It's called The Push. It's a, a, a mentalist is able to convince people to commit murder. And how they choose the people who are going to use, it's how the mirror neurons work. Somebody sits, they sit too. Somebody says, it's very, very, it's very, very interesting. It's called The Push. I think it's Netflix or Prime. I'm not sure where it is. You can always Google it. But it really was a powerful example of how the mirror neurons would cause people or invite people to take action simply because someone else does. It may sound manipulative, but if you are convinced your message is important and say, listen, would you agree it's important for all of us to at least do table topics once a month? Would you agree it's a good idea? Yeah. Hand, hands up. You're nodding. Thank you so much, Becky. Okay. It, we don't, because we believe it to be true, we simply invite the audience to agree with us. And that's a small, simple way. Raise your hand, nod, smile. Simple technique on the platform to engage, involved, and involve your audience to be a part of the program. But we also presenters, you want to tell stories, right? You want to, you want to share what's going on. You want to give the audience the experience. But very often we tell our audiences about what happened. I call this reporting. We narrate what happened to tell it what happened when we went down there. I say, don't report. I say, transport. Don't report. Don't tell us about what happened. Take us to the scene. Give us the experience so we can see what happened. I could have told you yesterday, my high school football team and this kid Leo, they were at the stadium and he had to leave the bench and go down to the field and he got turned away and he had to go back to the bench would have been true. But to give you the experience, I had to transport you there with Leo and his teammates. For example, those who were here today, quick, quick question. If you were here online yesterday, I want to answer this question. Where was Leo sitting with his team? What part, where was he sitting with his, with his team on the bench? Right, but what, what part of the bench? Yeah. At the end. Could you see that in your, in your mind's eye? I took you there. You could see he was on the end of the bench. The end of the bench. Whoa, thank you, Linda. Boom, 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 boom. Whoa, okay. I didn't tell you he was on the bench at the football field in the stadium. Was it a big stadium? Not really. Was it a big crowd? 22,000, 12,000 people were there for that game. Okay. You, um, I took you there. You saw him going down that cycling track across the long jump. And, right? And not just the track. It's across. Eight lanes are running track. Could you visualize that? Don't report. You transport your audience. That way your platform becomes almost a, a, mini, a mini scene, a stage where the audience can see and experience what was going on. So simple techniques. We often want to tell the story. Don't tell. Don't retell. Relive it. Don't report it. Transport us there. Give us the emotional experience. My friend and associate, Michael Haig, whose business is called Story Mastery. Michael Haig is a Hollywood script consultant to the stars. Major, major stars consult with Michael before they put their script in to complete their speeches, their, their movies. And Michael, <laughs> Michael knows my name. <laughs> He's got my cell phone number. And Michael says, the purpose of a story is to elicit emotion. And Leo's story was emotional. There's, I mean, you were on borderline sweaty eyeballs yesterday on that story. But when we take our audiences to the scene and give them a chance to experience it, that's a connection. Going back to our opening, you establish a connection. You keep that connection going through your stories. It's not just about a platform mechanics. It's about what happens on the platform or the virtual platform in the way we tell our stories. We want to relive the scene. And we want to apply what we call, what I call the, the VACO. Does anybody, anybody recall in the 80s a series of commercials for a company called Mako? Uh oh, better get Mako. <laughs> no, I say better get VACO, V A K O. <laughs> 
Now, there are those who call this the vax. I call it VACO because I'm a grammarian in some sense. And the V-A-K-O stands for, please feel free to screenshot my friends back there or pictures here, write this down. The V-A-K-O stands for the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, and the olfactory. Now, the V-A-K-S, S stands for smell. But smell is a noun. But these, I want to use adjectives, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and olfactory. What do I mean by that? Could anybody see the stadium yesterday? Auditory. Could you almost hear the crowd get quiet when Leo is standing there in front of 12 other people and he can't go? Can you hear that? And it isn't always easy to do the kinesthetic. But if I said to you, man, Andrea and I lived in New York for many, many years, 27 years. And we always thought it was going to be cold in the, in the wintertime. But in summers in New York City, oh my goodness, you walk out your door and the, the humidity will hit you like a ton of bricks. And all of a sudden, your hands feel really clammy. Who's been there before? Anybody? Okay, that's mirror neurons right there. That's asking the question, could you feel that clamminess in your hands? That's the kinesthetic. Okay, you talk about, man, the cat, cat on a hot tin roof. Ah, who tiptoe across the sand? Who, ha, 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 who? But I wanted to get to the beach, right? You almost feel that yourself. When you can, give the audience a kinesthetic experience. Yes, you can visualize. Can they hear? A small whisper. I almost didn't hear it. But it was a kid down the street. I'm making this up. But when you use these little techniques, they will get to see with their own eyes. They get to hear with their own ears, you know, or they can smell with their own nostrils. <laughs> my wife walked in, honey, you went to the bathroom, we put it by the match. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Nobody said I blame myself. I didn't say it was her. It's never her, it's always me. I know that. But you said, oh, I tell you the truth, this is the truth. On April 17th, Andrea and I did celebrate our, our 40th wedding anniversary. We went, to, we went to a resort uh, in Cancun for four days. And I tell you what, because we've been so busy, we'll be home upstairs in our own workspaces for hours and just saying hi and bye. Literally just not connecting. We got to Cancun, got the ride, bumpy dirt road to get to the back of the resort and it opened up to this beautiful place and the truth is our first day there one of the things that we we, we, we went smell that fresh sea air oh my gosh can you feel that na, 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 na. just a, or you go fresh coffee Ooh, man oh if it's pungent you give the audience a chance to smell it and you can show that here as well, okay? We walked in and I did this to, to Leffert on the way back, uh, on the way down here on Friday. We were in the car talk. Uh, no, outside, and we were talking outside. I said, Leffert, can you imagine what it's like, man? Just think back to when you got to grandma's house and she just baked a pie. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear that. Douglas, Douglas said, yeah, right? And nobody can cook like grandma, right? Would you agree? Oh, man, oof. Use these simple techniques to give the audience the experience of being there. It's a simple little technique that I use continually. And even online, I have done that effectively. And here's how I do it. Some comments here. Okay, good. And then, yes. Sometimes one of the tools you can use is not only the inhaling for the breathing it's how our eyes respond you know it's how it's how our face shows the audience what the experience was like you know oh man oh ooh, that hurt Oof. not just the word it's your whole presence it's all your whole being i believe we invest ourselves in our presentations for the benefit of our audience and we use the vehicle the visual the auditory the kinesthetic and the olfactory it adds to the experience but many of us are storytellers as well. And one of my favorite storytellers was a story reader, actually, when I was a kid in Jamaica growing up. It was my dad. He'd always read us bedtime stories. Can anyone recall being read bedtime stories or reading bedtime stories? Yeah. 
my dad would always read stories. And there were two of my favorite. One was called Monotaro or Little Peach. I don't recall the whole story, but I remember him telling it. I believe it's based on an old Chinese uh, taken from the sixth, sixth century. The other one was called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I mean, I was five years old. I didn't know about bears in a, in a house, but it just sounded cool. And it, it, and it did sound cool because my dad would tell the story of Goldilocks and the house by herself. She would talk to herself a lot, didn't she? I mean, she's like, didn't she talk to her? Just kind of, okay. But he get to the when a bear family comes home and bears could talk and bear, I mean, bears can do anything in fairy tales. But he, and then he said, my fa- papa bear saw his chair and said, somebody was sitting in my chair. I love that voice. And one of would say, somebody was sitting in my chair. And of course, there was Goldilocks. Who said? Yo, so you're so good at this. I wish I could hear you all online as well. I can't, I can only read, I can't hear it. I call this, I call this the Goldilocks effect. Because every time my father became a character, I was fascinated. So I call it me, the Goldilocks effect, where you become the character and we can hear the character. We can almost see the character in the way you, the speaker, tells the story. Can the audience see your characters? Can they visualize them? Can they imagine what it's like to be there with them in that stadium, on that bench, watching that kid over there warm up and do his jumping jacks? Can the audience feel something? One simple way is to become the character in a simple way by using their voice. And I don't mean you have to go, hi, 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 here, and low, 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 here, but just enough of a nuance so the audience can differentiate between characters. Think about this. In your most recent speech where you had dialogue, did your voice change even slightly for different characters? I'll go back to yesterday. You recall the official who, was, who turned me back that day. Well, your team has used all your subs, coach. He can't come, he can't play on the game. He got to go back to the bench. I don't worry about Jamaica, an accent and a deeper voice because that was the referee in charge. And the coach had a little different accent as well. You don't need to have major differences, just enough for the audience to differentiate the characters. We don't need to work extra hard to create major differences the characters' voices are just slightly different enough so the audience can differentiate. And how can we prove that? Especially with Zoom. It's cool with Zoom. If you could turn the screen off and they can hear different voices. By the way, it's the worst in the world when center stage creaks all the time. It's the worst place to creak. I'm trying to avoid it. But if they can, if they can close their eyes and say, okay, that's a dad, that's a son. If they can hear a difference, you're doing well. How do you test that on Zoom? Record yourself for 10 to 15 seconds, okay? Then play it back and don't look. Can you hear a difference? Simple self-test. Are my characters, can I identify the characters differently by how they sound? It's real simple. It's very, very simple. And these mechanics can even work online, okay? By the way, before I forget, I could spend a lot of time on, on, you know, how we use our language, how we use our words and all that. Just differentiate characters, but also understand this. When you have a platform, you can visually become different characters. How? It's, it's, it's how they walk. It's, it's their gait. It could be a limp. It could be somebody, how they walk upright. It could be, it could be the slouch. It could be not only the pitch of their voice, It could also be their speaking rate. Two characters. Hey, buddy, look over there. Car crash. It's crazy, man. This guy's in trouble. What's going on? Hey, man, slow down. What's going on? Oh, no, no, car car crash over there. Okay, back it up. Let me know what's happening. Two characters. One is easy going slow. The other is all sudden. Oh, no, 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 it's car crash over there. This guy's really bad. hurt. By simply having two different characters speak, and I, don't, I do not speak quickly very well. I am not Douglas Wilson. You were awesome last night, man. Disclaimer. That was good. I would not even attempt that. I'm no good at that. 
but simply the pitch, the rate of speech can be different. And we can become different characters on stage as well by our demeanor. There's a film out back in, I think it was back in the uh, in 1980s, where one particular character, an actor, showed us visually how we can physically transform ourselves on the platform. And it even can work online. Check this out. I think you'll appreciate this. Um, Lois, we uh, okay, did, did have a date tonight, uh, remember? Oh. Lois? Huh? You haven't been, uh, hmm? Oh, no, no. Well, I certainly <laughs> hope not. Well, let's uh, push off, shall we? I better get a coat. Uh, it might be kind okay. of cold up. No, I mean, uh, I need now a watch. person. I have to fix my hair and put some blush on. Wow. Wow. Voice. Look at his head. Good height. Head height. See it? Lois, there's something I have to tell you. I'm really. Um, I mean, I, I was uh, at first really nervous about tonight. Uh, but then I decided, well, Darn it, I was going to show you the time of your life. That's Clark, nice. I was thinking maybe we could go for a hamburger. Or... <laughs> now, what's cool about that little, little clip there is when, Clark, when Christopher Reeve went from here to here, someone said, wow. He almost grew three inches in front of our very eyes. It's a small technique, but when you become a character, all of a sudden, this can become this, and we see someone different. Now I know why glasses was a disguise. I mean, come on, who, who has glasses? It's Clark Kent, Superman, Clark Kent. Superman. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. But all kidding aside, by simply going from uh, uh, Lois, from here to Lois, I must tell you something. You almost see a different person. It's a simple technique, the transformation that we can actually show to others as well in our presentations if we realize the impact and the power of just doing something as simple as that. Is this helpful so far? I'm hoping that you will experiment and try some of this as your time goes by. Let me share the screen and go back to our next, our next slide. Okay, here we go. Come on, Mark. Uh, Let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my cheat, my, cheat, my cheat screen. There you go. For All goodness right. sake, didn't you hear me knocking? Uh -huh. Next one. All right. Um, so. Lois, we uh, did, did have a date tonight. Uh Good. Okay. Now, here's the truth. You don't need to use every inch of your stage. I can recall being in a contest one time and seeing an individual who, for the first time, had been on the main stage. Now, I confess, when I was, uh, coming up in Toastmasters, I went to a small club called Reader's Digest Toastmasters met in a meeting room at Reader's Digest headquarters, right? Not that much space. You get the area, that's not too bad. Division, okay, cool. District, ooh, I got a bigger stage. You get to region, sorry, I'm old school. Maybe, yeah, semifinals. The big stage is a big stage. And trust me, I have gone to district events in other parts of the world. We go to Saudi Arabia, and she's not in her head. We go to Saudi Arabia, they got a huge stage. They got flags, and I mean, they got, I mean, huge. And for the first time, you find yourself on a big stage and your mind says, I can't just use this little box. I got to use the whole stage. I got to go all the way over here. I got to go all the way over here and make sure I maximize my speaking area. You don't have to always do that. Sometimes it's easier just to adjust your body at angles to communicate here. Because when we use our whole stage and come to the end to the audience over here, Somebody's got my back to them. Not cool. And I've been in those bowling alley rooms, and I've been in those parking lot rooms where everything is wide. And you never know how a particular group will lay, will lay their chairs out. And quick sidebar, I learned this in schools for over the years. They'll tell the staff to arrange for an assembly in the gymna cafetorium. Who knows that one, <laughs> right? It's the gym, it's the cafeteria, it's the auditorium, it's a, or the MPR, the multi-purpose room. 
and the very, very hardworking, meticulous support staff will bring the chairs in in what they think is theater style. Let me explain. Now, I'm going to be out of frame for a second, but I'll come back and explain. What they'll do is they'll line the chairs up with an aisle in the middle, and the first chair on the end is over here. It's lined up like this. Now, if I sit here on the end and the stage is there, what am I looking at? A wall. And they don't often make it true theater style with a curve on it. So we feel, oh, I've got to reach to that person over there. So I come here to talk to them, and I have my back turned over here. It's often simpler to just use a body turn here. I can still com communicate here and use an angle here, here. And by the way, if you can, ask the event planner to not leave a center aisle. It's not church and not a wedding because center aisle is prime real estate to every speaker. We don't want to speak to an empty space. True theater, seats, aisle seats, aisle seats, angled. When I get that, hallelujah. Small thing, let angles work for you. I'm gonna go back one more time and try my zoom, my, uh, my share one more time and see what happens. It's not quite the same as it was yesterday, but we'll see, okay. Can our audience see this screen? Okay. For my own benefit, if I go to my view, does it change their view? It does change the view as well. It's okay. You'll see why I cheat. Okay. Use angles in confined spaces. We know that. All right. Very quickly, confined spaces for me means you get the famous Toastmasters District dinner event. You are the speaker, and you end up at a lectern, DG, D, the director is here, a guest is here, and you have this much space to move in to tell your story. Who's been there before? <laughs> Douglas has it, some of us. Yeah, I know. It's not, it's not, uh, it isn't that cool to do that. I, I, I totally get it, right? But again, we can use our angles, use our characters, use our faces, and whatever space we have, we want to maximize the value of the space. Now, we may also often have more room on the stage as well. And even virtual, we can do this. But wait, Mark, virtual, time out. Virtual, we have almost no space. Virtual is like, you know, just a little box on the screen. How can I maximize space with that? A couple of ways. One is, how far back is your screen, your camera, from your body? I don't mean go, like, was it Kermit, uh, 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 Grover? Near? Near? No, I don't mean that. But you want to give yourself room to have some movement on the back of the, back of the platform through Zoom. But you can use what I call the depth and the breadth of the stage, not the breadth, the breadth, the D and the breadth of it, the depth and the width to maximize the impact. A couple of years back, Mike Carr used a video screen, and he was using the angles of the video screen for his face and everything. He was maximizing that. Nitair Levy would do the screen and change scenes that way. But you can even use your screen, use your depth and your angles to portray a scene and give the audience an experience. I call this using angle in confined spaces and using depth and width for effect. What do I mean by that? Let's try this again, shall we? Let's try this one. At the age of 22, an accident completely changed my view of the world. Before the accident, I saw the world from the height of an invincible six feet. Now I see it from the height of a consummate navel gazer. <laughs> so I became short, seated, and recycled. But I soon faced discrimination. So I became the modern-day Don Quixote, fighting for the rights of those with a disability. Many, many times I would put on the armor of righteousness, mount my trusty gray horse, yee-haw! <laughs> Lower my lance and charge into hell for my heavenly cause, daring to dream of a world where discrimination no longer existed. But at other times, I would retreat, exhausted, and just want to become invisible. Now, right there, the ending, 
I'd retreat and just want to become invisible. Mark Hunter, 2009 world champion, is in a wheelchair. But he found a way to use the space he had to portray the feeling of invisibility. What did he do there? Help me out. And on the chat, what did Mark do to show, what did Mark do to show us how he felt invisible? I'm going to go to the chat first, then ask in the room, five, four, three, anyone in the room. What did he, one thing he did, yes. He made himself small. He hunched and bowed his head. Yes, what else did he do? He turned the chair. Yes, Michael. Took his eyes off the audience, and one more thing he did. Yeah, he, he did. He was, How do you reverse forward? I'm just messing with you, Carmel. He reversed. Yes, yes. The actual act of reversing shows regression, right? Yes, Lee. He slowed his rate of speech and he lowered his voice. That's five things we saw in a matter of two seconds to show you what it was like. What does that mean for you online? Let's see, online. He rolled back, stopped eye contact, yes. Hunched shoulders turned away. He sunk, uh oh, he sunk down in his chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. How can we do that minus a wheelchair? Well, I'll tell you. Being Jamaican, 18 years old in America for the first time, I got a job as a bank teller at Dollar Savings Bank on the Grand Con Concourse in the Bronx, New York. Forget about it, you know, in the Bronx. Hey, how you doing? Oh, really bad. But my Jamaican accent was much stronger at the time because I didn't have any experience in America. I'm a little Jamaican kid, 18 years old, just turned 19 and working in the bank and didn't always say everything the way Americans say it. And of course, when you're there in the middle of the Bronx, New York, with a Jamaican accent, and you have these New Yorkers, what did you say? What did you say, son? I don't, I don't understand him. What's he saying? I don't know. What do you want? You know, I began to feel so self-conscious that my confidence took a hit. And after a while, I just kind of wanted to fade away myself. Now, virtually, if you have the space, you can allow yourself to go not only back to show regression, but as Mark did, you can go back and at an angle, lower your voice, change your body. I wanted to hide. That you can do very effectively online because you can record yourself and you can experiment. You can test and try it. It can be very, very effective using the depth of the space and the angles as well to create the emotion of the scene you're trying to portray. Is this helpful for anyone? 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 Good. Excellent. Uh, oh, that's so cool. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and thank you so much, Diana, allowing us to interact with the speaker as if we could in person. We wanted that. And again, I commend our technical team for letting it happen that way. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay. So please understand how simple it is for us to do this if we, if we, if we see the value in it. So Mark Hunter uh, was very, very effective when he, when he did that, okay? By the way, I was going to ju jump in, and I, 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 I chose to insert this slide, slide for no reason. It's random, but I realized that we often tell stories of our past and our present and our future. I learned, and I actually saw a study on this by the... National Institute of Mental Health, or NIM, or whatever it was called, we in North America, part of the, most, most of the world, read left to right. So we think of the past as a being, being on our left and the future as being on our right. So as presenters, if we talk about the past, it's wise for us to point to our right audience's left as the past. Leo was over there back in 1976, right? As a kid, I always did so-and-so. And you can also visually do that. Now, I want to bring you back to when I was 15. When I was 15, I was confident. I could do anything. I was invincible. Rah! But as time went by, I realized, you know, I'm pretty much mortal. And now, as I'm 60 years old, I'm feeling pains. I'm looking ahead. Am I going to live like this for the rest of my life? But that's past. That's present. That's future. One technique, and I see contestants also use this. Here's where we are. I'm standing here on the stage in the 1994 World Championship of Public Speaking. I'm awestruck. 
how did I get here? I'm glad you asked. See, a year earlier, I'd been at my club when, that's what I did? I took it to the past. 94 is here. And now, 28 years later, I get the joy and privilege of sharing my ideas with the wonderful folks at District 58. I've come a long way since that first meeting, but I'm also oh glad I did. Simple technique, the audience almost knows that is your past. They'll look there. You can sim sim similarly, you can also set scenes on the stage. You can. Any more comments? Okay, cool. Real quick. Okay. This is a key, a key to really enhancing the audience experience. It is this. Replace some narration with dialogue. That's a deeper dive than saying, you know, don't report transport. This is a deeper dive. Specifically, replace some narration with dialogue. Why? One, you don't want a monologue, all narration. Or two, you don't want a one-person play, right? You have to decide what's a right, appropriate balance. Here's a one of the reasons I like dialogue. And I'll say this very quickly, and I hope you can catch this. I happen to like dialogue because, let me stop sharing for a second. I happen to like dialogue because for me, dialogue is also a tool that I can use to inform the audience of details without telling them. For example, I could tell you that my brother and sister had planned to be on the trip. They were late. They had to change their flight and they, were, they got there two hours late, but it was all worked out. I could instead say, hon, did you hear Woody and Justin missed their flight? It's okay. They're going to get there two hours later. In my conversation with my wife, you hear what's happening with somebody else. I let our dialogue tell you what's happening. Other than, oh, well, the day came, and Andrew and I were worried about Woody and Justin, and if we found out that they had missed their flight, it was going to be two hours late, it became a thing. What if I said, that day, our, my brother wasn't there. I said, hon, I found out Woody and Justin they missed their flight. They're going to come in two hours. We're going to be okay, all right? It also gives you a, a window into our relationship, how we relate, and it feels that much more real than just telling you what happened. Narration over dialogue is effective, and sometimes you want to choose the best places to insert dialogue. You want to choose the best places to insert dialogue. You have to be selective to be effective, or conversely, to be effective, you must be selective. Write that down. Write that down. To be effective, <laughs> you must be selective. You can't do all or nothing of one or the other. This one is really cool. I'm going to give you one for the visual for our, for our friends at home. Let me share this one slide with you very quickly, okay? And I'll explain to you as soon as I can. Here is a share slide. Where is my Zoom? Zoom, 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 share your slide and stay in. Okay. Some of our best dialogue is nonverbal. Mark, that does not make any sense. Dialogue, by definition, is verbal. Yes, it's a cute statement to make you at least a little bit curious. I'll give an example of what I mean by dialogue being nonverbal. Back in the early 1980s, I worked in an IT shop as a computer programmer. I had a boss named, I'll call, I'll call him Steve, because his name is Steve. And um, <laughs> he reminded me of the original Penguin played by Burtis Meredith in the Batman series in the 1960s. Now, I was a new kid, you know, he like walk around, he was kind of unkempt and like, like this, and he, you know, Mark, hey, Mark, 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 you know, hey, Mark, like, whack, 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 Mark. It's Steve. Now, I'm a new kid on the block, I'm a new guy, okay? And I was in one of those padded cells, you know, cubicles, anybody been those? The, yeah, right? I'm in a cubicle. I'm, I'm a new guy there, and one day I'm at my desk, like Monday, after, Monday afternoon, and Steve came waddling over. Hey, Mark, 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 I, I got another job for you right here. I got to do this for me, okay? And, and, and I wanted to get this, and, and, and back to you, okay? He gave me an assignment on a paper napkin, which was not protocol, obviously. And I sat there, and I said to myself, what in the world? Then I heard, Psst, hey, you guy behind me. Now I knew that Silent Dave sat behind me. Silent Dave talking to me. I'm like, 
Huh? What? Huh? I look back. All of a sudden, hey, you guy, that was Steve, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Let me guess. He gave you an assignment on a paper napkin or something like that. Yeah. How did you know? It's Steve. I know him. Listen. Do yourself a favor. Don't do anything for three days. I'm new here. He's my boss. I can't just not do anything. Trust me, I know Steve. He's going to come back and change his mind. Listen, I'm new here. I don't take a chance to lose my job because it's three days, three days, three days. <laughs> I got to work on this thing. Be the best I could. And sure enough, three days later, Steve came waddling over. Hey, hey, Mark, 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 I, I think I gave you to do uh, on Monday. Listen, I, I, don't, don't worry about it. Forget about it. I, I'll talk to you today, okay? Just forget about it, okay? I see. Bye. And he waddled away. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I put everything down to work on this for three days, and you tell me to not do it? I'm like, and then I heard it. <laughs> And Dave was gone. And Steve taught me a lesson about management and leadership. Be aware of what your people are doing. Take your time. Make good decisions. Don't rush to a call. Give it some time. Think it through. Because you will, you will save so much time, so many man hours, and so much money if you simply take some time and make more clear decisions. True story, every word, every scene. Now, the nonverbal dialogue, who had nonverbal dialogue in, in, in the story? Just now, help me out. Silent Dave, right? What was the best part of his nonverbal dialogue? What did, he, what did he say at the very end? What did, he, what, what did he say, though? I told you so. I told you so, but I didn't use the words. It was just the. So think, are there opportunities for you to use nonverbals to verbal, but have the emotion connect with the audience? Right? It's a simple technique, but you master this, it'll set you apart from the average storyteller or speaker because these simple techniques are memorable. I never said I told you so, you told me I told you so. Simple but powerful techniques. Any comments in the chat? Laughter and snickering. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. It's a nonverbal, but you get the message. I was working with Darren LaCroix when he was competing in a Toastmasters contest back in 2001. Have you, have you seen Dar Darren LaCroix's speech on video? Many of you have not. Have? If you have not, it's, it's, it's fun to watch. It's the only world champion winning speech that goes over 7 minutes and 45 seconds. But that's not a story all by itself. Timing device failed, you get 30 seconds grace, and he uses 30 seconds, almost all of it, <laughs> and he won the contest. But there's one scene in his speech where he talks about bombing at a comedy club one night. And when he told me the story, so Darren, it's a great story to tell. Tell him what happened about how you've had this failure, how it impacted you. I want to share that, that little clip, less than a minute long, and tell you the evolution of this clip. Okay, here we go again. Thank you, Diana. He's a pretty good speaker and coach. I kind of like him too. I talked to him about eight times a week. He's my brother. We work together a lot. Okay, share. Let's see if we can get this to work. After a year of struggling in the comedy world, I'll never forget one night. I was bombing for 20 minutes. It was horrible. So I went for my surefire bit. I brought a woman up from the audience and she stood directly behind me. She put her hands forward in place of mine. It's an old improv technique. She would tell the story with her hand gestures as I would tell it verbally. And it works best the more animated the hands are. Well, this woman stood there like an ancient statue. <laughs> she didn't move. I turned to her in desperation. I said, please do something with your hands. She did. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. When we first wrote on that story, 
His last line was, I said, please, something with your hands. She did. She covered my mouth. What was more effective? She covered my mouth or just, she did. You laughed. The action told the story. Sometimes the nonverbal is more effective than the verbal. Yes, mom, dad, I want to be a comedian. I was met. So sometimes when you don't say it, but you show it, it's effective. One more little tidbit for you regarding the presentation skill and the platform master, it's this. There are times when the reaction is more effective and tells a story than the words you use. The reaction. When, when Steve told me to, you know, when I heard, when I heard Dave Snicker <laughs> behind me, I went, what am I thinking here? Oh boy, yeah, he was right. I didn't say the words. I let my reaction tell you how I was feeling. Again, simple but powerful technique. We are speakers. We're taught to speak, but sometimes we don't need to speak. We just need to be. We need to relive. We need to re-experience. That's part of the art of plat master, the platform. It isn't always the words. It's how they come across. It's our demeanor. And sometimes it's how we just pause and say nothing. We fall on our face and we stay there for a long time. Like Darren LaCroix did. Ooh, that was kind of weird. But what can we do to give the audience a clearer picture of our message, of our emotion, of what we want them to walk away with? It's just simple, again, these are simple techniques that I've been using for a long time, but I wanted to share them with you because I believe that we can all be effective. Now, one more thing. I'm going to ask also here in the chat. Thank you, Action Louder Than Words. Golden Nuggets. Well, thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. Okay? We say, Actions often speak other than words. Yes. And we have you ever seen a speaker who would just be did is always moving? Just kind of moving all the time? My wife and I were in a hotel room <laughs> yesterday and someone across the hall came out and she was just saying how beautiful my wife my wife's hair is and she wasn't lying. Come on, hey, right? But she was literally like this. Man, you, you look you look so good. Man, I, I love your hair. We could be like sisters, you know. And it's like I was like, I think she's on something, but I don't want to say it, you know. <laughs> But some speakers, it could be nerves, or it could be desire to reach everybody. And I got to make sure Alan sees me. I got to get over here to make sure that John sees me as well. And we're talking and we're moving. We're constantly moving, constantly moving. But I recommend that we move. Here we go. I like that. Oh, move with purpose. Why am I moving here? Why do I? Why am I moving? I recommend simply this. You stand your ground on key points of wisdom. When you make a point, stand your ground and make a point. If the one thing I want to tell you, Darren LaCroix, the most important thing to know is to be a good speaker is stage time, stage time, stage time. No. The most important thing is this. Stage time, stage time, stage time. You hold your ground when making a point. Ask yourself, why am I moving here? I'm not saying you're bound to the red dot. No offense, Brother Lefford, okay? All right? But I'm saying, if you're going to use your stage, use it. But when you make a point, stand your ground, it shows that this is important. When you can, set some scenes so we can block where that took place, where, and the audience will remember if you place a character there, they say blocking in, in, a, in, in, in acting, I'm told. If you set that, you create that scene to remember it. But it's really key to stand your ground when making a point. Establish scenes in your speaking area. That's going to be where Leo was on the bench every single time I do it, okay? In my speech, it's always to my right. That's where Leo on the bench is. And the football field is always right here. When he comes with the coach, why? The edge equals sidelines. See that? Ah, oh, purposefully. You got to know, ask yourself, why? Why am I moving? I said, I will go back. Ask, why am I moving here? If you can answer that question, it'll be more meaningful to you. And as a result, consequently, more meaningful to your audience as well. Okay? But Mark, 
what about all these gestures that I want to do? <laughs> now, I grew up seeing speakers who would say, believe in yourself, because if you do, I guarantee you can be all that you can be. I'm thinking, to me, a, and Darren LaCroix hates the word gesture. See the, the quotes in the word gestures? A gesture should be an extension of your natural self. I've seen speakers who make it a point that everything they say has to be connected in some way to a specific movement or gesture. I don't know, okay. Here's his rule of thumb. Would you say it this way in normal conversation with your friends over coffee or over Starbucks, which is not even coffee, it's like, I don't know, jewelry. Uh, <laughs> How would you sound and check your language? I, I, I was laughing yesterday. I was watching one of those cop shows, you know, First 48. I even wrote a blog about this about two years ago. Why, let's, let's just try and minimize the cop speak, shall we? The cop speak? Uh, but I mean, you, you see a report where, the, where, the, where a cop will say, I'll stop sharing for a second. The cop will say, well, the suspect exited the vehicle at the intersection and made his way across the parking lot and vaulted a fence, and he took up into a residence nearby. We deployed, a, we deployed three officers who, who apprehended him, and he's now in a, incarcerated at a custody facility. Wait. He ran, we caught him, he's in jail. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious, but do you normally say we apprehended him or we intercepted him? Hey, we caught him, we stopped him. And very often we want to write for the eye and not for the ear. So it looks good on paper, but when we say it, that doesn't sound like you. Now, I'm a word nerd. I will use a few choice words here and there. But generally, look at your script again. Are there words there that you would not normally use in general conversation? Because unintentionally, what we may find ourselves doing with these choice words is we are creating a situation where we may come across, we may come across caution, as being less authentic than we normally are. There's nothing wrong with a simple vocabulary that portrays the point. One of the most watched Toastmasters world champion speeches was delivered in 2014 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, by a man named Dananjaya Hetirachi from Colombo, Sri Lanka, for whom English is his third language. By show of hands, have you seen I See Something on video? If you have not seen the speech I See Something, Go to YouTube, not now what I'm talking, and watch I See Something. I believe he has 7.4 million views. His language is simple. It is honest. It is authentic. It is real. And the authenticity, it was the first time since 1994, and I've only missed two finals since 94. It was the only time I've seen. But he announced third. They announced, announced second. And before they announced first, his name was being yelled across the room. His language is very simple. You check how many times he uses multiple syllable words or big words. He doesn't. He kept it simple and honest and conversational. Last year, Verdi Price, she just told her story of vulnerability. Ramona Smith, vulnerability. Aaron Beverly, it's simple language. We tend to think, I need to find a nice choice of word. And I tell you, I know I used specific words and triads back in 95. I didn't know what I was doing, but they seemed to work for me. But there's some things I may change, some words I may not use anymore, because I want to keep it simple enough for everyone to understand. It's in, in the pathways, lessons, incredible speech. Okay, good. Too much movement can equal motion sickness. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. <laughs> Too much movement equals motion sickness. Really, I, I really appreciate that. Here's the point. A gesture should be an extension of you and who you really are. Let's keep it there. I'm going to keep going. I want to get some, uh, some specifics about, about virtual in a second. One last question I'm often asked is, and for the virtual, I'll, I'll share this, this slide for virtual. Um, Oops, sorry, I'm in the wrong screen. I got all thumbs today. And here's a question. Is it unwise for us to use props? Here's the answer I will give to you. That depends. A prop can be a wonderful tool as long as it does not overtake you and your message. 
If your prop is so strong, your audience is always looking at your prop and not at you, your prop is in the wrong place. I'll say it again. If your prop is so strong, your audience is focused on the prop, it's in the wrong place. A prop is a visual aid, not a visual overtaker. Perhaps it needs to go to the undertaker. But a prop, well, how big should a prop be? As big as it needs to be and as small as it can be. Oh, you like that, don't you? Back in 1993, my friend Morgan MacArthur, who beat me in 94, by the way, brought a life-size collapsible horse on stage in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Her name was Jasmine. You probably could find that somewhere on the internet. Uh, 93, uh, Morgan MacArthur. It's, uh, it's, you've got horsepower, it's called. A life-size collapsible horse on stage. There's one guy brought a ladder on stage, a 15-foot ladder on stage, where he went up to get a kiss. I forget his name, Robert something, I think his name was, okay? I have seen all kinds of props. People now have a table and flowers and a chair. They build a set on stage. If you don't have to, then don't. I use a, when I was working, working with kids, one of my props was a packet of tissues as a prop. I told the kids, listen, I am just a guy who talks to kids, but I carry these to dry the eyes of kids like you. Stop me in America's hallways. Tell me their stories and cry on my shoulder every day. And I used one pack of these in the school this morning down the street because kids are hurting. That's my prop. And they get the idea. So choose your props wisely. Don't lean on them, but they're there to aid you and support you in what you have to do. I've said a lot about the physical stage today. And I hope you've got some nuggets from this, but it would not be fair to our virtual and even to you who are using virtual to not touch a couple, in a couple of areas of what virtual needs to do, okay? Virtual dulls connection. So what do we need to do specifically virtually that's going to really make an impact on our audience, okay? So I don't need any, any slides for this. Get a decent camera. The catch is some cameras are motion sensitive, so when you move, it blurs and then refocuses. You want to make sure your setting is such that when you move, the camera doesn't blur by itself and give you some kind of weird thing. So get a decent camera. You can go online to Amazon. I like a place called B&H Photo Video. Not B-L-H, but we're close. B&H Photo Video and also Sweetwater are two sources. I get the endorsement. They agree. When I said B&H, she's like, yes, B&H Photo Video, New York City. What's cool with B&H and Sweetwater is you can call them with a question. And they'll answer your question free of charge just to help you. I wanted to buy a new microphone back, belt pack and stuff. And I, he said, what do you have right now? Well, I got this and this and this. Oh, you don't need to do that. You, you, you have your Samsung, you, ha you, ha you have your, uh, your Sennheiser. Just simply get like a MicPort Pro. Put that in there with, with, and you, you, you merge your XLR to USB with a MicPort Pro. You'll be good to go. You don't need to buy anything more. I go, oh, cool. Thank you. I know I talked gibberish just now. I know Don and... and, and and uh, Bernie get it when I say the bike port pro on the XLR to the USB, they get it. But the point is they told me all this, didn't cost me a penny. I, have, I already had to need it. Yeah, he'll help you out, so go to them. I have a, what's called a Logitech Brio 4K camera. And um, for those online, here are some images for you to look at of what I use, okay? I have this camera here, which is it? Come on, Mark, share it, share it. It's a Logitech Brio. It's coming, it's, there you go. And that's me taking a picture of my pic camera with my phone camera. I also have a decent set of light. You can buy, again, you can buy this online on Amazon. Get a good microphone. I have what's called a Yeti Blue. If you wonder what it looks like, there's one in John's hand right now. It isn't really blue, it's actually silver. And the cool thing with that Yeti Blue, um, and the picture's on, on the screen, so don't, don't worry. You can look on, on my screen. The cool thing with the Yeti Blue is that you have different pattern settings. We can do one setting for an individual speaker, and, uh, like a podcast. We can do an interview, different setting. We can put one of those in the middle of the room right now. It'll pick you up. It's a really cool mic for like 150 bucks to do all of these things. Or it can go a, a lapel mic, like a roadie go. This is a roadie microphone right here. But choose what works best for you and how much you want to invest, okay? Um, also, it helps to have lights, some pretty cool lights. Um, I don't have a setup like this. I don't have umbrella lights and all that. I, I'm not anywhere near that. What I do have are called newer, N-E-W-E-E-R lights. 
And my setup is I convert my son's bedroom to my office. I got a, a twin bed in there. I got a, I got a treadmill in there. I got, you know, my clothes in there because my wife's got a closet. And um, anyway, did I just say that out loud? Let's rewind that, shall we? Good, rewind that. Good. I didn't say that. I have a newer light. And that's my room, okay? I also have a blessing of natural light through the windows behind me. That's my laptop, my clock, set up for a speech I was giving. And one of my lights is a newer light. I have a other side on the right, I have another newer light. In the background is my treadmill and the window. Above me, my overhead lights, check, check this out. I bought, I went, to, I went to Home Depot or Lowe's, I got Echo Smart Daylight Bulbs, 60 watt. As you will see, it generates white light, not yellow light. Look around the room, those are yellow lights. The Echo Smart Daylight gives you white light. So I've got the white light in front of me. I've got two angled newers on this side. And additionally, you'll see in the back, I've got an open window with natural light, even though my treadmill is folded up to block the window. That helps me to get a good picture. You can buy these online at Amazon or ask b and Photo Video or ask Sweetwater. That's one word, Sweetwater. It can help you out with that too, okay? Um, let's see. Ah, oh, when you're online, please, please, please avoid distracting your audience. How do you do that? When you choose your speaking area online, take a picture of it on your Zoom or a snapshot and ask yourself, if this was not my house and my background, what would I not like about it? I have attended webinars where the presenter is in the kitchen in front of a refrigerator and what's always on the fridge? Kids' drawings and magnets and every knickknack. And it's a distraction. I didn't even know this. When I began doing online programs, I chose to go with a virtual background. And I went around my house and took pictures of my sofa, of my, picture, my bookcase. I thought, that would be cool. I'd look like I'm really, really cool with a very studious backdrop with an office look. What's wrong? Well, see my, look, there's my Yeti microphone. What's wrong with my background? What do you see, first of all, anybody, real quick, what do you see online? What do you see on my background that you do not like? Real quick, one or two words. What do you see? Was that? The light switch, yes. Anything else? My daughter's head is cut off. Are you kidding me? Exactly, head cut off. Picture missing head, half picture, headless picture. Four people said the picture. Thank you for being honest. I did not even think about it. I got my Yeti mic. I got my pop filter. I had my headphones on so I had sound good. And I had a crappy background and didn't realize it. Okay? And it's a distraction. People ask, oh, the book. I read the book Love Works. Who sees Love Works? You can't read hard to see. Can you see? Love Works, the white book. Okay. Over my fingers. Yes, yeah, small picture. And I got set up. I, I saw that book, Love Works. It's a good book. Distracted because want to read all the book titles. Thank you, Lisa. I believe that. Right? You can turn a few of the books so you can see yeah, the cover. Right? It's, it's people, and I did not even think about it. That was my backdrop for the longest while. But many of us also make mistakes. One of my clients looked like that. Now, I have her permission to share this with you. Okay. Okay. I have her permission to share. I talked to her about this because she didn't realize it. That's how she was. And I cut her head off so you can't see her face. But you can see her jewelry. <laughs> you can, right? And we don't know that we can be distracting people. We had a virtual contest some time ago. Young man, new Toastmaster competing, humorous contest. And he was all set to go. At the last minute, he chose, I'm going to do it standing, not sitting. His whole theme was different hats and different characters. Different hats, different characters, right? And when he stood up to speak, um, let me go. Wait. He didn't change his camera lens. And he talked about hats. What hats do we see? <laughs> now, we laugh about this, Okay. But this happened because he was inexperienced. I called him. We had a Zoom. We talked about it. Brand new Toastmaster, not used to the virtual. 
But we can do these simple changes to make it a better experience for our listeners if we realize all we need to do is adjust a few things. Now, one of my catch lines is focus on your friends behind the lens, which means you want your eyes to be level with the camera lens. And also, if you're doing a program, especially if you're with somebody else who's not in the room with you, you want to be, be aware, am I looking at the screen or at the camera? One of my friends was doing a, a live program on Facebook one night with a moderator asking him questions for a different location. And he kept, I kept seeing him doing this. That's a good question, you know. I found out last week that so-and-so, and he's talking to the guy on the screen, and the camera's here, and I'm seeing this the whole time. I get my mobile phone out, and I pop him a text. I say, dude, man, you need to look at the camera, right? Where did I put it? Okay, here. I said, please focus your eyes on the camera lens on your computer. You seem to be looking at Josh. And he said to me, I was looking directly at my iPad. I said, that's a problem. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I could have done. I'm looking at the pad. I'm, looking, I'm telling you, I'm looking at the iPad. Yes, you are looking at your partner, not at the camera lens, I said. And then he said, thank you for your criticism. In other words, leave me alone. He didn't get it. When you, are, when you are the speaker, look at the camera. When you are listening, you can look at the person. When you are the speaker, look at the camera. Focus on your friends behind the lens. Look right through that lens to the people who are there, okay? Thank you for your constructive criticism. I said, okay. You know what? Here are two iPads. Here's a red marker. When you speak, look at that thing. It's called a camera. And depending on the model, it may be in a different place. Who's learned that the hard way? It's counterintuitive, but you practice looking at a little white dot. And there are ways to remind yourself like that. Look here, <laughs> look here. Put a little st a sticky note. One of our friends actually put a picture of her friend, her face, cut a hole in the nose, and put the hole over the camera lens. It looks like that. So now she always looks at somebody, but that, that little dot on her nose is the lens. It forces her to look at the lens. Put a picture of your family, somebody you love or somebody you hate. I don't know. Okay? But watch. Even experienced Toastmasters make the mistake. I, had, I went to an event virtually, and the, and the person in charge had the camera too low on the desk. People still do this. And here's what I saw. Actual Toastmaster leader. Anybody for some double chin? Anyone? Anyone? No, we kind of laugh at that, but we're doing this to ourselves. We are doing this to ourselves and we are creating our own distractions. So please be aware. Simply elevate your camera to eye level. Every contestant hears this. But you don't need to be a contestant to learn this. These are small things we can do virtually to own the stage, to have that eye contact, have that intimate connection to our audience. Please remember these simple things. And whatever you do, don't be boring. Okay? I, I, I don't know how many people <laughs> when they hear us online end up looking like that. But please, please, please don't be boring. Has this been helpful to you so far? I have all of two minutes left before I got to end this thing, and I, I, I almost hate to say it, but it, it, it is what it is. Um, I'm not going to go through. Uh, I want to show you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things you can do online to really engage your audience. We call them pace elements, things that you, you switch up during a talk to make the audience stay engaged. Okay, so I'm going to share this very quickly. These, and, and there's 22 of them, but we're only going to share a few of them. We call these pace elements, okay? And there's a list. A talking head is someone who just stands there and talks or sits there and talks. We're talking heads. But you use your stories, your anecdotes, and your case studies as tools to change the way they think. And you can also ask your audience to type in the chat. We're doing it here right now. Type in the chat, okay? Good, right? Type in the chat. Raise your hand. We did that live. Emojis, reactions, I asked for that. You can have a Q&A session a different way for the audience to engage. You can do a slide share, I've done that as well. Just simple ways you can re-engage the audience. Take a snapshot, do a screen grab, 
a screenshot over here if you want to, of some simple ways to remind ourselves to keep our audiences engaged, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land this puppy real quickly. Has this been helpful so far? Yes. Online. Helpful, yes or yes? Okay, good. Let's land this plane now, Mark, before we get done. One thought about slides. I will say this today. I did add some text on slides for one purpose, to give our online people a chance, friends, a chance to do screenshots if they wanted to. But you'll see I have large font. I had 129 and 139 font. Few words. Please note carefully. I'm going to run through these slides very quickly for you, for you to help. It's kind of rude to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway because I, because I, because I can. If you're only going to read your slides, why do I need you? Okay? I'm just saying. Engage your audience. Talk to them. And it's okay to let your slides be your guide. Let your slide be your guide. Go in presenter mode so you'll see your next slide. You have notes to yourself. Here, it looks like, it kind of looks like this. Uh, let's see. Let me stop uh, here. Let me do this. New share. Oh, here it is. Oh, you, you already got it. Okay, sorry. Never mind. Come on, go away. Go away. That's presenter mode. I know my next slide. Okay? Cheat, cheat, cheat notes are okay. All right? So I'm going to keep it here so you can see, you can see what, what I do when I'm, when I'm... Okay? I know cheat notes are okay. What's coming next? My example. My, my, my workspace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop um, the... I'm going to stop the regular share. I want you to see the picture in full, in full, in full, in full flight. Okay, so here we go. Here we are. Share this. Cheat notes are okay. Pilot, he's got cheat notes. Mark Brown has cheat notes. I have two laptops at home. I've got one with my cheat on the left. I've got my on the right. I got my lights, my windows, and sometimes I'll even be away from home doing a program in a hotel or somebody's house. I'll cheat. My notes are all post-its across my screen. That's a full keynote right there. That is a full 45-minute keynote on those. I went to my father's-in-law's place. He passed away. We had to go and do some, some cleaning up, and I had to give a presentation. I brought my laptop. I brought my mic. I brought my lights, and I brought my cheat notes and did that across the screen. There are different ways you can help yourself, Okay. And people say, Mark, that's a brilliant idea. Well, I think of it because I did. It's okay. Whatever can help you to be effective. And the cool thing is this. Because my cheat notes are aren't across my screen, guess what? Eye level, I have paired to be talking to the audience anyway. And I use keywords, just like the movies. Rehearse your story. See the sunshine. That was for a keynote for a major franchise here in North America. I had to wear my red shirt and everything and look good for it, but I had that there. Love your team. Questions in the statements. I know what all those things mean. A whole keynote in six, in six post-its across my screen close to the camera. Give yourself every advantage. You do this, you will seem like a genius. You will shine online because you know what you are doing. It is not that difficult to do, okay? I was going to say, let's have some questions, but our time is pretty much up. And I do hope that the ideas of how we can use the physical platform, using the depth, the width, using our bodies, using our faces, using the nonverbals at the very beginning, using our introduction, the before rapport, all these ideas over time, you won't use them all at once tomorrow. But if you took some decent notes, and if you can say, okay, let me try to add this piece or this piece as time goes by. I'm talking 28 years of speaking to get all this together and the last five or six virtually, okay? But if you can begin to use these and encourage use within your clubs, it's a powerful thing. And by the way, I'm going to do one quick shout out. That mirror um, in the contest last night that was strategically placed in front of the screen, it's only the point to her. She's right there. She's right here. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. And the mirror being black was also, I saw the mirror being black at the back. It was cool. That spoke to me. But see, you look, I, good technique. I've got to try that. Good technique. Pick things up and begin to use them. Broaden your experience and your expertise. And that's how you shine. 
Use these techniques, replacing the verbal with the physical. Knowing when to stand your ground, when to use dialogue, when to interact, and above all, establish that before a poor and please, please, please write your own introduction. Over time, as you apply these principles, these tools, and these techniques, I will guarantee you will shine on stage and online. Once again, my pleasure serving you. Uh, my pleasure being with you. Yes, you. My pleasure serving you. My pleasure being with you for the last couple of days. And for those who are online who did not get to see my bride, she's going to come and join me on stage so you will see her. The camera's right there. <laughs> Come forward a little bit. I don't know if you can't zoom, can you? Can you zoom? Can you zoom in on the zoom for her unbeautiful face? I don't want to see my face. If no, say no. It's all right. But we you know we, we I can't kid about being in a car with Ledford for seven hours on Friday. He made the commitment to join us for that for that time. And all the way down, we talked about what it was going to be like to be here, a small, intimate group. And for me and for us, it's been a joy and a pleasure. It's okay, my head gets cut off, it's fine. Let's get her in the, in the, in the, in the frame, right? This is Andrea, my wife, my 40, my 40 years worth of, of wife, of, of husbanding, and I'm still learning the, uh, the trade. And she has been supporting me all along. So thank you for letting us be here. Thank you. Thanks, darling. I'm gonna return control. And by the way, for those online, I see a couple of comments in here as well. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you all, thank you all. I urge you, give, the, give every audience every gift you have with everything you have. Serve your audience as well. Be honest, be open, be conversational, and I guarantee you're going to shine on stage, online. Lefford Fate, my brother, thank you. All yours, sir.